year with the name M. Joannis, exactly, <laughs> is uh, currently the head of external uh, relations at uh, DNDI, uh, based in uh, Geneva. And DNDI is an organization working um, on drugs and neglected diseases around the world. Uh, as she uh, told us uh, earlier, there are several of them working around the world uh, on this uh, issue, and it is a very important uh, medical issue. Prior to this, uh, she worked at McGill University uh, in Canada, and um, here comes the big part. In her career, she has uh, fundraised more than uh, 330 uh, million euros. So um, if you want to exchange <laughs> that uh, you can go on Google and check that out in your own currency. So we are very um, happy to have um, Michelle with us today. Uh, so Michelle, the floor is yours. Thank you, Anita, for the introduction, and thanks, Adriana, for inviting me uh, to join and, and meet all of you. It's nice to see 21 participants right now. Um, yes, indeed, it's kind of uh, interesting when I hear that I've, uh, myself and a team, of course, have raised $330 million in about 20 years and uh, worked in different, different areas, uh, launching different fundraising campaigns. And that's something that I kind of maybe will weave through my presentation is that every, every country, every organization has their own uh, trademark in terms of how they raise funds. So before I, I get started, and maybe more people will join in, I was hoping that maybe some of you might want to share with the group how much money you have raised in the past and how much you hope to raise in the next, uh, in 2016 or 16, 17. It's over 12, 12 month period. So if, if, if that's okay to just go do a quick go around. So introduce yourself, where you're from and how much money you raised and how much money you hope to raise, or maybe the chapter raised and how much you hope to raise. Just, this will give you a sense in terms of what I'm, I'm dealing with. Does anybody want to start? Yeah, maybe. Hello. Hello. Uh, thank you for the uh, webinar, first of all. And uh, I'm Levan, I'm from Georgia, currently living in Poland. I founded Oikos Tbilisi chapter uh, like five years ago in Georgia and uh, like for like five periods in general in Georgia like our team working on sustainability raised around uh, uh, 1 million uh, US dollars but uh, for five years but uh, like all including all projects sustainability projects uh, but currently but currently Georgia is like moving a bit developed into developed countries and it will be much more difficult for our chapter to raise funds and uh, because before that we had a lot of grants there but currently it's not like that so we hope around one uh, 50, uh, 55,000 up to 100,000 uh, US dollars for the next uh, next year okay including all projects thank you okay anybody else want to uh Share how much maybe the chapter raised before and how much you hope to raise uh, next year. Don't be daunted by by Levan's big big target here. Every everything is a challenge, no matter how much you try to raise. Yeah, maybe to show the opposite. So I'm Clementine from France. I was the president of Oikos France chapter in the northeast part of France. Uh, I'm not anymore, but when I was a president, I had a hard time to, to fundraise and we only got 1,000 euros. Okay. And we had that thanks to our school. <laughs> so I'm not very proud of it, but that shows the opposite side. Yep. And how much do you hope to raise or how much do you think this, your, the French, Northeast France uh, hopes to raise? Um, right now, I don't know how much they need. I guess most of the projects depend as well on the... Everything is linked. So if we don't have a lot of money, we do projects without needing money. And if we try to do big projects, we need money. So we don't do them because we don't have money. But if we don't do them, then we don't have money. So, yeah. Yeah, it's a vicious circle. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> 
Merci Clémentine. Anybody else wants to take a dive? I'll take three examples. Another one sort of saw, it was a Sangar. I don't know, your hand was waving. Did you want to share? Uh, okay, uh, so my name is Sagar. I am the president of Oikos Kolkata in India. So we are a student body within the campus and we get our funds from the student association of our university. And currently our budget as a student body is around 25,000 rupees, which is currently into like 400 US dollars. So uh, last year it was around 300 US dollars and this year we got an increase of 100. So Currently, my objective is to keep it like it like that, or have an increase in the budget from our student body. Okay. And um, if if I were to just again just do a little quick, so thank you for all your good examples. This is very helpful. If um, if I could just go around and maybe a few of you share with me some of your expectation of this session, because I can, I've prepared some information. I, I will share it with you because no matter the size of your campaign, whether you're raising a, a thousand or you're raising 300 or 55,000, uh, all the same principles apply. Um, so if I could just go around, maybe a few of you share some of your expectations uh, from this session, I can maybe make sure that I cover those specifically. Could be anything. Could be like the art of asking for a donation, the art of identifying potential donors, how to build a plan to reach your target. Hello, Any may, I, yeah? may I raise my hand? <laughs> yes. Hello. 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 Good evening, Mr. Jones. Uh, my name is Vlad Kutovic, and I'm the president of Oikos Prague. And actually, as you just start, uh, started, uh, I would actually be interested in uh, that art asking for donors or actually approaching people because uh, I think we or at least our chapter has like uh, our dream is to get at least one to two thousand euros because we kind of you know need uh, the money to sustain ourselves and it's been uh, difficult for us uh, to ask the proper, I, I guess the proper people or just to approach the proper people so we kind of would like to you know to get uh, an overview or a side <laughs> how to you know how to target who I want uh, who could actually benefit who I could benefit from and stuff like that if am I being clear is that yeah it's very clear right? very clear thank yep thank you anybody else have specific needs than Prague uh, good uh, evening or day whatever uh, my name is Vusal I'm from uh, Oikos in Baku in Azerbaijan so uh, I, I would be happy to know whether uh, it is important to uh, reach some particular company or bank. I mean, which kind of entity we should approach and uh, what would be better to, like, which, which kind of uh, companies or organizations would be better to reach uh, to get, like, a positive response, I would say. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yes, Levan. Yeah, my question is, like, uh, Maybe we can talk about also like uh, corporate uh, donors and also foundations who just uh, have specific grants and uh, give specific grants to uh, organizations. But also regarding corporation donors, like for sure, like having grants, it's not really sustainable and it may be finished very soon and they just uh, stop uh, financing projects. But regarding corporation donors, how important is that to having their like what they expect from us, like what they need from us as an organization. Some donors want them to have a logo on our website or something like that. So because mostly like our chapters, our chapter don't really want them to promote as, a, as an organization and so on. So how important is that for or corporate donors itself? Thank you. Okay. Super. Okay, so I'll, I'll get started. These are great. And you know what, I'll take a pause and then we'll revisit if there's some specific expectation, maybe midway through, so that uh, to make sure that I, I address uh, most of your, your questions. So it's about 510 here in Geneva. I don't know what time it is where you are. Um, so probably in about half an hour, I'll just take a little break. We'll regroup and see if there's other pressing questions and hopefully I can, I can address those. So again, thank 
thank you very much. Um, just wanted to say that again, um, the the basics of fundraising are the same. So whether you're running a big campaign like I am here with an organization with 16 full-time staff, or you're doing it on a volunteer basis, it's really important to. Um, uh, there are four elements to uh, to launching a good plan, no matter how much you try to raise. And I'm going to share my screen right now and get right into it. So let's see here. If this is uh, going to work. Voila. Um, let's see here. Voila. All right. So there's there's four there's there's four elements that. Every time I think about a donor um, that I have to put in place. So one of them is, is understanding what is your story? What's your case for support? What are you trying to raise funds for? And having a good grasp of that is very key because this is what will inspire your audience. So whether it's a company, whether it's a foundation or an individual or an alumni of the program or maybe a professor that you're trying to engage, Understanding what is the outcome and the impact of OICOS and your chapter specifically in your region is really important. And it's got to be summarized in about 30 seconds. And that is the challenge. So for example, where I work, I'm a medical organization and we work on tropical disease and we try to find better treatments for the poor. That's what we do. It's that clear, it's that simple. You need to be able to articulate what you want to achieve, you your pre as, as presidents, but also the members. We must all have the same language. We all must align around what we want to achieve. Because then when you meet with people, we all have the, com the same common understanding of, of what is our purpose, what we seek to achieve. Sometimes, you know, I hear people say, oh, well, I want to raise money for a conference. Okay, that's the product. That, that is how you will, your, your story will materialize. But what you want to do is tell them how you want to improve society through sustainable development activities or whichever your chapter is trying to uh, achieve. So understanding your story is very important. So that's one element. I'm going to dive into that a little bit more. The second element that's really key to any fundraising is under and having a strong leadership. Who is going to be behind this campaign? So Clementine, I don't know, I, I'm not seeing your face right now on the screen because I'm sharing my screen, but when you say, you know, you got a, a thousand from the university, hey, it's not easy. Universities are public institutions for the most part, especially in Europe. They don't have a lot of money to give away. So I don't know what story you told them, but obviously you probably did this on a volunteer basis and you went to them and asked them for that amount of money. Perhaps you did it by writing. But these are having that leadership, having volunteers that are very passionate about what you're doing is also very important because they're going to be the message. They're going to deliver the message. They're going to engage people. So that's a second element. The third element is identifying donors. And we talked a little bit, you, you raised that as an issue in terms of how do we find these people? What do we, how, you know, how do I know what they want from me? So I understand that you've been doing this for a while. So Clearly, you have some donors that have been supporting you, and you must go back to them. You must, you must track those relationships, because developing a new relationship with someone is very lengthy. Just, take it, just consider it on a personal basis. When you meet someone new, it takes a long time before you become best friends. So imagine if every year you're trying to make new best friends, it becomes very tiring. Instead of just working the relationships that you have right now and deepening them is a lot easier. And when I say deepening them, is deepening their engagement so that they give you even more, so that the university moves from 1,000 to maybe 1,500 the following year. Or maybe it's those that gave to in Georgia um, that are able to renew their support and bring you up to that uh, to that goal of fifty five thousand to a hundred thousand. So donors is also very important to develop a new ones, but also stewarding or building those relationships with the old ones that the last president presidents developed. I think it's also important to have a plan, a 
timeline, maybe a donor pyramid, and I'll show you what that's all about. Some communication material, it doesn't have to be fancy. And also when I say a budget, I know you said, well, if we don't have any money, I, you know, how am I supposed to spend money to raise money? But we can be very creative here. And again, it depends on your fundraising goal. Sometimes it's just being having access to a printer where you can print things. That, that's part of your expenses to raise a little bit of money in case you need to write to these people or in case you need to call them and there's long distance, long distance fees to reaching them and so on. Or maybe you need to go visit with them. So it doesn't have to be a large, you know, uh, 10,000 uh, euro budget. Okay, so these are some of the four elements that you must have when you prepare for a campaign, no matter the size of the, of the goal. I'm going to go now into a little bit more deeper in terms of what is a case for support. This is your story, as I was telling you. It's that 30 seconds, what do I want to do? What impact am I working towards? What are the outcomes? And then specifically, what will be my outputs? Meaning, what is it going to look like? What are going to be my activities? Is it going to be a conference? Is it going to be a fellowship? Is it going to be uh, inviting guest lectures to specific programs? going into different corporations and perhaps uh, presenting a little bit about what ICOS does. Those are actually the tangibles, how you're going to spend the money. But what you're aiming for is a lot larger, it's a lot bigger idea. Like We want to eradicate poverty by giving new treatments to those who are, are, are most sick. So those are some of the really basic things that we want to do. And we're going to do that by finding new treatments, new drugs that they can take. So, uh, so telling your story is really important and backing it up and you guys are all in university. So you understand backing this up with data. So what, what kind of figures can you give them qualitative, quantitative? Why are you doing this? Why are you part of Oikos? Because obviously there's a need, there's a public need. Um, there's, uh, there's a rationale behind it, but if you can support that by providing some hard facts, some evidence of what your key achievements have been in the past, that's also very helpful. And this is helpful for corporations, for foundations, even for alumni that you want to go visit, maybe professors that you want to tap into their network, and other, other folks, universities, you name it, different associations out there. So if you can back up your case, your story with some data, that's really good. Also images. So, you know, I talked about how um, I understand that some of you are organizing conferences on an annual basis, having pictures of the previous year to show the participation, to show some of the speakers that you've been able to bring that might, um, that might give you some leverage, that might give you some clout. These are also important. So please share amongst yourselves. So maybe one chapter may not have uh, slide decks of, of pictures, but if, if another one does, there's no, there's no harm in sharing amongst you some of the resources that you have. And also gathering some testimonials, like bring the story to life. It's all fine and dandy to talk about, you know, uh, in my case, new drugs and so on. But it's great when I have a doctor or a nurse that can tell us how this new treatment has made it so much easier for them to treat their patients who are now coming back to life. So having a few testimonies, maybe people that you've invited, even yourself, make it up. You write it and ask them if they'll sign off on it. That's often what I do, is, is the best thing. So, so tell, decide what you want in terms of testimony and write it out and then just get their approval. But again, this is all part of your case for support in telling the story about why people should give and why they should invest in what you're doing because it's commendable. Does that make sense? Because if it does, I'm going to go next to the next slide. So, okay. Now, one of the things that I do want to make sure is that, you know, we get, we, we're so passionate about what we do. I mean, for me, what I do is the only thing that's important, <laughs> just like you. But sometimes we can't do it all. We have to also be realistic. So when we do uh, decide what will be the, the goal of our fundraising campaign, we also have to be realistic that we can't do it all. We have to be, we have to select. 
And that makes some strategic choices. And that's usually based on, on an exchange of what we feel we want to achieve, but also what our audience expects of us. So, you know, we may want to put on a conference for 50,000 people in Las Vegas because they have the space, but is that realistic? Maybe it's more realistic to have something a little bit more smaller, more reasonable. Maybe we do it on campus and then eventually grow it and grow it over time. But it's all about, it's important when we, we do tell our stories that we pick specifically what we want to achieve because you know what we want to go back to these people and tell them who those who have given to us what we've done we want to tell them that we surpassed our expectations and we've got some evidence to show and and um, essentially we've delivered on what we promised we would We've been able to change behaviors of people. We've been able to ch change corporate behaviors and so on and so forth. So make sure that what you do pick is realistic, that you can execute it and you can execute, execute it well based on the resources that you have. And that's people, their time, uh, their level of energy as well. Huh? So here again, I'm not going to read every single aspect of, of, uh, of the slide. It's more for you to read after, but it's a support to what I'm saying, so it stays behind it in case someone joins in a little later. Again, just reiterating, um, most of our plans, they usually grow out of you know, where we want to be, say, in 12 months from now, but not everything also is going to be appealing to a donor. So for example, I remember when I was working at McGill University in the Faculty of Medicine and we wanted to raise money for all sorts of different departments. I would have these scientists that would come to me and say, you know, I really need money to pay my salary, my secretary's salary. And I'd say, well, I'm not sure that's really a compelling story. Tell me about the research that you're doing and what you're trying to solve what is, the, what is the problem that you're trying to address? And then I will inspire the donors based on that. So if you're doing cancer research, tell me about the research that you're doing and why this is so important. And eventually we will get money, which will pay for your secretary who is supporting this bigger picture, this bigger goal of finding a better treatment for cancer. So again, I need you to think a little bit about that. So it's all fine to say I want to organize a conference. Um, that, that may not be super inspiring, but if you talk about sustainability um, to specific audiences, that will be a little bit more compelling, a lot more compelling, and then it translates because you found that the medium to reach that goal, the activities, is the best way served through a conference. So, a, articulating what you want to do, you really have to think about that. Think about where you want to be in 12 months from now and why you need that money. The bigger picture. Okay? I talked a little bit about leadership, and this can be you. This can be alumni. It can be other members of your chapters who lend you a helping hand. I never work alone. I work with the leadership of the organization. You may want to work with the international office as well and finding out what are their big priorities and how you align with them and, and engage them because they may have some contacts in different countries or maybe they don't or maybe they, <laughs> here I am, Adriana is going to get a lot of, and Adriana and Anita are going to get a lot of phone calls from you. But it's important to broaden your network um, as leaders and as volunteers to try to raise money. Because you do have to play an active role. You know, sometimes we think we just send an email out and, and we'll get money. I, I wish it was that easy, but that's very rarely the case. You have to work a little bit harder at it. And having people that can open doors for you is also going to be very helpful. So that's why I put in here the alumni chat the, the alumni from your from your chapters who may have gone on and now they're working in different organizations. They may wish, these are people that you can consult and ask if they would get involved in opening doors where they're currently working, because of course they understand your purpose, your organization very well. So these are important people to keep in mind. They're great connectors. Um, 
also former or other organizations who've given you also in the past can also become leaders for you in opening doors and connecting you with the right people in the organization. Because it's fine to approach a corporation, but you actually know who you should address that letter to. Because you have to remember, there's so many organizations out there that are doing the same thing. The stronger your connection, the better the likelihood. And also the stronger the alignment between what the corporation or what the foundation or the individual want and what you're proposing, the closer the alignment, the better the success rate. Okay, so finding some leaders is really important. Don't do this on your own. Try to engage people that can help you. So going to now next to, to the donors. Um, this is a big aspect. I'm, I'm going to remind this because I know how it is. You know, we have people that are taking a role in a chapter for a little while and then they move on and the relationships may have been with that individual. It's really important to build relationships with donors that stay with the chapter and that that information is captured because it is really important. I have a lot more ease in renewing and upgrading. And what I mean by upgrading is increasing the giving of a specific donor that's already engaged with me than finding a new donor. Because finding a new donor, I remember the ratio was I would have to do a minimum of about 10 visits to maybe potentially identify one that had an alignment with, with our organization. In some cases, it can be even higher. The ratio can be even higher. You may have to contact 15 to 20 people to secure one gift. And that's because you don't know what their priorities are. You may have done a little bit of research on them online trying to figure out what are some of their interests but honestly if you can amongst yourselves create a little system it doesn't have to be complicated it can be, even be an excel spreadsheet where you keep track of who's given to you in the past and go back to them and ask them to renew their support and upgrade their support because you've you've hit your your targets you're a lot well off, you're a lot better off. So when I hear Georgia and how you've, you've secured money in the past, you need to go back to see these people. You need to tell them what you've achieved with the money that they gave you, and then you need to inspire them with your new story and where you want to go in next year in renewing their support and upgrading their, their commitment. I also want to, uh, one of the things that I also do is I try to uh, engage donor over a period of time. So inviting them to give maybe three years in a row. So multi-year giving. So instead of having that one shot, one gift, and then having to go back again next year, it allows me to go back and develop maybe a new donor, like find a new donor so that I'm not going to be constantly just renewing renewing i have i have some some um i have some financial security knowing that these donors will give me you know say a thousand a year for the next three years so for example the university you may want to approach them and say you know last year you gave us a thousand that was terrific this is what we were able to achieve with your with the money that you gave us um we would love to renew your support would you can and and if you would, we have, we're a little bit more ambitious. We're hoping that you might even consider a gift in the range of 1,000 to 1,500 a year for the next three years. So now you've just secured potentially 450,000, uh, 4,500 for the next three years. And that means that you can start freeing up your time and looking at potential new donors. So these multi-year gifts, are a godsend for us fundraisers. It's very helpful. It's also reassuring for the organization because we know what we can do the following year. So looking at who's given to you, how do we identify new ones? Well, it's through your network. Uh, there's no, there's no, it's, it's not, uh, it's not like there's a book where you can just open up a page and start with the alphabet A and just go down through the whole book until you hit C and write to everyone is a waste of time and, and energy and resources. You have to be a little bit more selective. And so this is where your leadership and your volunteers can be very helpful in identifying potential donors to help you.
I would even go beyond and, and engage with some of the professors that are write, writing on this topic to see who would they know that they, you could approach because you're, you're, you, you know, these are the things that you want to achieve. There's no, there's no, it's, there's no easy way, but it's really leveraging that, um, that network that you've built. So A, amongst yourselves. And literally, I sit down with my team every year and I say, which donor, where, who, who, who can we develop? Who have we heard about? Who do you know that we should approach? And we literally come up with a big long list and then we prioritize them. We prioritize them based on a spectrum, a spectrum starting from those that may not know us, but they may have a lot of money, to those that know us and may have a little bit of money. My, my guess is I always go for the ones who know us and who have a little bit of money versus those that do not know us and have a lot of money because you know what? Everybody's looking at those ones and it'll be very hard for us to compete. You can eventually maybe develop a plan to build those relationships down the pipeline, but it may take you two years of consistent work to building that relationship and moving them to getting really engaged with ICOS. So here's an example. Um, when I worked in another organization, we often talked about the Bill Gates, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, because they have a lot of money. We thought, wow, let's get money from them. They have a lot of money. But they didn't know who the heck we were. They had no idea. They, you know, if I would call them and tell them my organization, they'd say, mm, never heard of you. So they have a lot of money, but they're totally not engaged. Then I started looking at other foundations that actually knew who we were. And one of them was Médecins Sans Frontières. They were one of our founding partners. I went to see them and I asked them if they would consider supporting us, not just you know with the idea, but investing in us financially. And they made a commitment to us. So trying to identify and prioritizing donors that know you is really key to get started. After that, you can start working back that pipeline and you know, start building people that may not know you. And you may build their interest by inviting them to come and meet with you. You may invite them to be a speaker if you think that they would be a valuable speaker at an event. You may want to go and visit them and tell them a little bit about your work. Not, I'm not saying that the door will necessarily be open, but these are ways that you can build a relationship over time. And this is very key. Um, it, it, it doesn't happen overnight. Uh, I, I have some donors that I worked for five years before I actually received a contribution from them. And it was that difficult because they received so many different requests from different people. Even though I felt that there was alignment between what we were doing and their interest, they weren't seeing it initially. And it took them time to warm up and eventually get to that point. But it really is about building long-term relationships. All right, I'm going to go to the next slide because I think um, I talk tell them talk a little bit more about what um, you know what what's important for finding new donors. Um, again, I'm suggesting you know you start with doing a brainstorming amongst your group and invite people that are not necessarily in your group. Maybe they will be able to open doors for you. Um, this is, again, something that I do regularly, and it's not because they're not necessarily a member of Oikos. They, may be, they just may have some connections for you and, and would be willing to open one to two doors is, 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 is fantastic. Um, sometimes you can push in and ask them to open five doors, but that's pretty much the limit. After that, people get a little bit tired, especially if they're not a member of your chapter. Um, one of the key things is that, uh, that you need to gauge their level of attachment to your organization. I talked a little bit about that on that spectrum. So don't know who you are, fully engaged. You need to balance that out again to determine um, your priority in terms of who you might want to go to. Um, and yeah, we talked a little bit about that, about uh, who's interested in your chapters and our outcomes. Like when I say your outcomes, meaning what you hope to deliver um, and to address. The other thing that um, I always go in armed and ready is knowing how much I might ask them to support. 
it's really important. You know, it's, it's when we were, well, when we were all very young kids, we didn't have a bank account and any, any money. We would go up to our parents and say, hey, I really want this pair of running shoes. We were very specific about what we wanted. Be specific with your donors as well. You may want to give them a range, right? Your parents, you may have said, hey, I really want the whole outfit, but let's start with the sneakers, with the shoes. Then you got what you, at least the basic that you wanted. Maybe you got the whole outfit too if you're a really good fundraiser. But it's the same thing with donors. So when I say things like, you know, I'm going to give, again, just because I, Clementine, you were very specific with your example that you asked the university for a thousand, you may want to go back to them and say, you know, I'm really hoping that you will consider a gift in the range of a thousand to a thousand five hundred for the next year. And if you can, we would really appreciate it if you can renew that commitment for the next three years. Because these are real simple. And then after that, you don't say anything. You let them talk. Even though you might be very nervous and want to fill that silence. So again, you go to see those donors and be ready to know how much you want from them. Just like when you were going to your parents and saying, I want that pair of jeans. Probably you didn't tell them how much it cost. You just said that pair of jeans and then you got the money after or whatever. But you need to be very specific and you need to know it in your head what you want. I never go there blankly without knowing. I always have a target. And then I gauge whether or not I'm in the right range and I never lowball, meaning I never drop the amount if I feel that in my that this is a realistic and justifiable amount, I just go for it. So I've asked people everywhere from 10, 10 euros to 45 million euros. And it's always been the same strategy. Doesn't matter the amount. All right, let's go. Let's continue for another good five, five minutes. And then I'll just take a break and we'll reconvene. I talked about the importance of having a plan. It's really important, you know, to keep the momentum because this is tough work. I'll admit I've been doing this for 20 years and I, I love it. I love it. And I know it's tough. Maybe I don't feel it as much anymore, but it's high pressure, especially when you want to deliver and you want to have a specific amount of money and you have some, some really great ideas that you want to execute. It's so important to know what are your timelines. So, for example, if you're saying that we need in our budget by, I don't know, May 2016, we really need to have a thousand or five thousand or ten thousand in our bank accounts. You then work back in terms of how are you going to get there? What are some critical dates? So, here, for example, I would say A, start with identifying your list of prospects. Who might those be? So, organize a meeting with your colleagues. Get that chapter a lot, it, like to come together and say, we're going to have a work session. We're going to identify the donors, what we want to approach. We're going to have a whole list, and then we're going to prioritize them as a group. That would be one, exa one exercise, very concrete example. The next step is, again, you want to identify how much you're going to ask these people, because that sets the tone. You'll be able to differentiate, does it make sense that we ask the, you know, such and such corporation for 500 and that corporation for 5,000? You need to make some logic around that. So identifying your donors, organize your meeting, get your people to identify potential donors, and then connectors. Who can open those doors for you? So that also will prioritize your list because, again, it's, it's all fine and dandy to come up with a huge list of donors if you actually have no connection with them. It's going to be a lot more work. I, I'm not saying it's impossible because I do it all the time. I have a blank page. I have a name, and I have to figure out how I'm going to meet them. But it's, it's even better if you do have a connector. And then um, once you've identified your connector, work with them. You may be the connector, eh, by the way. It doesn't always have to be an outsider. I can be the connector. Uh, Adriana can be the, the, the connector. Who knows? We all are connectors. Maybe our professors can be connectors as well. Um, so then, then you start rolling out a plan. You need to determine what is your story. What are you going to raise funds for as well? 
because you've got to create that alignment between what you're doing and what their interests are. Um, to force it upon and to force it upon the donor is not going to work and to, to adapt your chapter's vision and mission and objectives to the donor may also not work either because you may not deliver on what you want to do if you are sort of pleasing the, the foundation or the corporation or the individual that wants to give to you. So it's really important to determine what you want to achieve and find alignment with those that you're, you're seeking funding for. So that, so after that, um, once you've identified the people, you've identified how you're going to open those doors, then you literally have to start with the, what we call the, in our, our little world, the fundraising world, is the cultivation process. So what are the steps that you're going to take? Are you going to do this over the phone, which is fine? Are you going to do it by a combination of phone, email at the same time, meaning you call, you leave a message? A lot of people don't answer their phones anymore and then follow up with a with a formal email saying I would like to get in touch with you I have a very exciting uh, proposition to make or a very nice um, project that we'd love your in your your involvement and your feedback on then um, once you've established that contact I never tend to write everything out. I try to tease them a little bit, try to get their initial engagement because it's harder to say no to someone than to say, um, uh, then if I send them all the information, then they can just respond, no, not interested. But if you just tease them a little bit, um, instead of getting them excited about what you're doing, then the likelihood of that, that follow-up is a lot stronger. So again, um, I like to do the combination of phone and email or phone. I don't do mail anymore. I used to, but not anymore. So those are the combinations. I do them very much timely. And then if, um, and in my email, I often refer to the voicemail that I may have left. I said, you know, uh, dear Mrs. So-and-so, uh, left you a voice, uh, left you a message. I'm very excited about this project. Um, love to chat with you a little bit more about it. How, when, when would be a good time to connect? So this you can do even with the, the, the current donors, right? This is not just with new donors. This is something that you can do with the current donors. And then you want to have them on the phone, or if you can, visit with them. That's even better because it's even harder to say no to someone in, in, for, in person. Think about it again. When you were a young kid, would you write your parents an email and say, hey, can you buy me a pair of running shoes? No, you'd be a lot more persuasive if you're in person, right? It's the same rules apply. It's how you can sort of influence the person in front of you. You're not asking money for yourself right now. You're asking money for a really great cause. So you also have to sort of detach yourself. You're, doing, you're not doing yourself a favor. You're not getting yourself a pair of shoes. You're getting the organization to where it wants to be. So those are what I call the cultivation phases. And that can range anywhere between a few, a few weeks, a few months. It can be something that you do all year long because these meetings where you identify donors, you can have them on a regular basis. Maybe you say we do this four times a year where we identify donors and we refresh the list. Um, and then after that, you always have to think about, and this is something that came up in terms of, of um, use of logos and so on, the stewardship aspect. So we call it stewardship. It's kind of an internal term, but it's how do we recognize the support from these people that got engaged with our organization? Sometimes you just put them on your website. You put, if you look at some of the websites that I've worked on or that donations that I've worked, we just list their name. We didn't put their logos. If you feel that putting their logos would actually strengthen your organization, then by all means. But I think internally, all of you, all the chapters should kind of align on what might, uh, might be appropriate for, for your organization. So maybe this is something for the international, the international office to think about and give some guidelines to the chapters. Or maybe the guideline is as you wish, and that's okay as well. Um, there is sometimes expectations about uh, promotion, promoting uh, the organization that's giving to you. I would say often that is in the context of organizing a public event where they might want to have some recognition for their support. 
you often see this um, at conferences or maybe a big festival. Those are considered more sponsorship and that's why you see their logos. So there's actually a marketing aspect uh, to their giving. It's less philanthropic. It's less giving out of the goodness of their heart. It's more they want to reach this audience that you're bringing forward. And this is a way for them to get visibility. So there's, there's two types of things. So a ship, a little bit more of a commercial aspect to it. And then the other aspect is the philanthropic, which is more giving out of the goodness and not necessarily expecting anything back other than you delivering on your promise of, of reaching the outcomes that you are seeking with your, your activities. Uh, let's see here. I'm, I'm actually almost uh, wrapping things up, so it's pretty good. So um, just a quick little wrap up here in terms of, of uh, what's important. Again, we talked about your story, and that's your vision, your mission. What do you want to achieve? And then translating that, and, and I, you know, maybe we need to look at what the international office is doing and aligning the chapters so that you're all singing from the same songbook. You're all speaking the same language. But if there's a little bit of discrepancy right now, that's okay. You can still raise money. Um, identifying what are the priorities of the chapter. And again, you may have more priorities that will be a that then you can actually fundraise for. So then you might have to be selective. What will be most appealing to your audience? Think about the donors in front of you and what do you think they might want to support? So that may make you have to make some strategic choices and trade-offs like saying, okay, we're not gonna do this one this year. Maybe we'll do it in two years from now or next year. Then identifying your volunteers and some people that can help you identify uh, donors. Developing, I say, when I say marketing tours, it doesn't have to be very fancy. It could just be, um, it could be, it could just be document that you, like a word document. It, and I'll get to my last slide on this because I think sometimes we often think we need some materials. That's often more of a safety, a, a security blanket when we go visit donors where we feel we have to have something to give them. I, I go and I have nothing. I just go and I listen to them, listen to what their interests are. And then in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, how can I align this with what I'm doing? How can I change what they're saying to me so that it aligns with what I want to say? And I leave, I give them my business card and that's it. And then I follow up. I follow up with an email. I follow up with maybe more of a, a proposition that I've written out specifically tailored to them. But I often have nothing. I may, I may have a general brochure of the organization, but sometimes I don't even have that. I might even actually send it as a follow-up. And then, and then as I talked about uh, some of the cultivation and the solicitation, those are some of the sequences in which we, uh, we do our campaigns. Um, I talked a little bit about, again, part of the planning is uh, creating a donor pyramid. Part of your planning, it's part also of shaping how much you want to raise funds for. So assuming you've done your good homework of identifying potential donors, new ones, but also the old ones that you're going to renew, and depending on your target, again here I just picked a, a random number based on my conversation with Anita and Adriana, I picked 5,000. So let's say your annual target is to raise 5,000. The way I think about it is I'm going to have to secure about 30, 30 gifts, roughly 30 donations. If I want to reach this target, I have to find one that will give me 1,000, two that will give me about 500, three, 250, five that will give me 150, eight at 100, and then a random number of 14, about 50, about 50 euros. So this kind of sets the tone. And this is just an example. You can change this pyramid as well. It might be that you have a, a lead gift of 2,000. And then maybe you have three at 500. And then the rest spread over. It's really good, again, to um, have a dollar amount in mind in terms of when you're looking at your donors and what you think they might give because and you want to start with the top the most hard the biggest amounts first huh? um, i'll explain a little bit why also on this slide what i mentioned is that 
every time I put these pyramids together, I try to identify at least four names of people that can give at these different levels. Because maybe only one will come through. So when I, this top of the pyramid, I want to try to identify when I pull this list together, four names, corporations, foundations, individuals, you name it, associations, that have the capacity and I feel comfortable asking them for a thousand. And then I want to have at least um, eight names of people that might have the capacity to give 500. And then I might have, I want to have 12 names for 250 and so on and so forth. So when you're meeting with your group, this is kind of the list you want to try to identify maybe 132 names. And you'll see eventually some will drop off real quick. But if you have that kind of ratio, the likelihood is a little bit better at reaching your target. Okay. Um, so I build these pyramids all the time where about 20%, no, sorry, 80% of your target will come from about 10 donors. That's it. And the rest is just little smaller gifts. I also concentrate on the bigger gifts because that helps me set the tone to securing money from others. So I remember, for example, there was this campaign where we were approaching law firms, you know, the uh, lawyers and the different, different lawyers' uh, offices. And we would start saying, hey, that lawyer's office gave us so much would you consider matching what they're giving? So if you start with people at a thousand, then it makes it a little easier if you're going to their competitors or maybe they're not competitors, but their sister organization in getting them to match that amount. So if, again, in the context of, of your work, uh, this might be something where you might wanna look at an industry where there may be a few people a few corporations or uh, organization in that industry that you can go see and leverage this um, the fact that you secured one gift and get other gifts from others in the same industry. So again, I think I've gone over this. So literally uh, putting the list of names and the giving ranges that you want to secure. And again, keep in mind that multi-year because that's very, very helpful. Um, just in my, I think this is my last slide. It's just looking at, um, often we think people give because, um, yeah, because of promotional material and they, they don't, they don't also give out of being forced or feeling obligated. They really, people give because they believe in what you do. Uh, they believe in, in your, your civic responsibility or, or essentially the purpose of your organization. They want to they want to invest in projects with a significant social return, and also they have a high regards for the leadership, for your leadership in what you're trying to achieve um, with your organization. So I think it's important to to be reminded of that that people people are not going to give if they don't you know if they they don't see alignment, um, but the, and they're also not going to give because of promotional material. It's more your own sense of, of belief in what you're, you're doing and the validity of it and the long-term impact of it. I put down there a reference for a really quick, short book. Um, I always buy it to new staff, and I love it. It's very, very, uh, I think it's, what, 99 quick, small pages, and it shows you, it's the classic fundraising book on how to ask for money. I've showed you a little bit in my presentation how to do that, you know, um, but he goes into it a little bit more in depth and I'm happy to, uh, to work with you um, on, um, on more of, uh, of these ways of asking people for money. So I'm gonna, I'm, I went a little bit over time. It's almost six o'clock, but I'm happy to stay on a little bit longer. Um, questions, so much information. Can I? Yes. Uh, am I heard? Am yes, I can hear you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I'm from Prague also. And I, as I was listening to your uh, presentation, very interesting one, I must say. Um, I had like uh, this uh, idea. There are two basic ways of fundraising, like approaching the donors. 
The first is um, a quick one, like I have a project and I just email them, I just call them in order to just get in touch and that's it, like I fundraise rise quickly. Perfect. Yes, and this, the other, other way is uh, to create a longer relationship. I mean, um, just go and visit and invite them to, to, my, to, to, to some event, I don't know. And um, the problem is the main challenge in almost every chapter that, uh, that there are high fluctuation rates, that every year uh, the students come and go and they're not stable. Like, there are stable members, but they are not that much uh, in our network. So what would you recommend uh, to, to face this uh, challenge? And to, to, to bridge, bridge yes. that gap. Yes. I mean, this is, this is very normal, even whether it's a chapter, whether it's an organization, there's always turnover, right? I think the, the trick uh, here is, and I'm going to put it on your shoulders right now, is to be detailed in, in, in uh, documenting your relationship so that the next person who comes up, they can literally say, you know, hello, um, my name is Sangar. I'm taking over from Kemal Sin, who was the last president. And I, she told, you know, she, I would like to meet with you and follow up on what you've built with Kemal Sin and what we'd like to achieve next. So it's, you need to bridge that gap because it is, it is normal. I, I live through that all the time where I see staff turnover and the relationship didn't necessarily get handed over. So uh, this, this is part of life. Um, but being a little bit creative and maybe using the name of the last president that they may have met or they may have heard of is one way I would, I would go about it. So continuing the story from that last person and you building that bridge. That same way. I think the other way though, I honestly, I think it's very important. Again, I'm hoping that this went through is the importance of documenting all those relationships that you have. Um, so that the next person can kind of read through your notes or read through what may have happened and mimic what you've done. So for example, um, I have some donors who like to just um, receive a phone call and others that like to meet in person. And, and instead of just changing everything because we're new, it, you, need, you need to align with how that person wants wants to be communicated with. So if they were used to seeing, uh, I don't know, Taco, if, if, if your predecessor visited that person, then I would recommend you visit with that person. And yeah. also, yeah. if I may add something um, related to Oikos chapters, I do think that, um, well, obviously we can't tell the people that are now alumni, but for you guys here, like always stay available for the people that come afterwards. I think that is so crucial because it is very easy to become involved in something else really quickly. You don't have any more time to do anything else for the chapter. I totally understand that. Um, but I, for example, for my chapter, when, when I left, um, and I know some of you are also doing that, I stayed there for like half the year, um, to make sure to explain to them everything and still now I'm in touch with the person that came like two years after me um, so I do think that together with documenting which is absolutely crucial and we have stated that several times um, also the fact of just you know since we're so passionate about Oikos let's stay in touch or at least stay available um, within the alumni network stay available for the people that come after you because um, the knowledge that you have is, is super crucial and what you've learned throughout um, the, the, the experience in Oikos um, should not really be lost, ideally. So, are there other questions? Yeah. Yes, Clémentine, yes. Yeah, I have a question because I know that other chapters uh, have the same problem. How can we attract people, members, to do that job? Because it's really hard and it's not like there are a lot of people who don't like to do it. So how to attract them to do that? So I've, I, I make it easy for them. 
I really make it easy for them. I simplify the task and take on most of the work, I'll be honest. Um, what that means is, uh, let's say, for example, you approach an alumni who's working for a corporation. I, I would say, you know what, I'd love to come and meet, where, come and see where you work. Would you be willing to introduce me to a decision maker um, and accompany me? And then as a fundraiser, I'm the one that asks for the money. And that's kind of my job. Um, if, say, for example, it's an alumni who's done fundraising, they may be willing to do the asking, but they may, be, they may feel awkward because it's their employer or it's their company and they, they're uncomfortable. But if they can introduce you, I mean, it doesn't engage them in any way. Um, it's like someone asking me in my class, uh, so Adriana and I uh, are both completing the same week, she's completed the same degree that I'm about to complete, um, I would feel comfortable in, in going up to Adriana and saying, hey, could you introduce me to someone in your organization? It doesn't, you know, doesn't engage Adriana in any shape or form. The person that I'll be meeting with is ultimately the decision maker. And uh, you know what? Everybody asks everybody for money. We have to remember that. So you're not the first one that's knocking on that door. They've, they've, they are adults. They've received these requests in the past. So just keep that in mind. And don't be, don't, don't be afraid to ask. I ask all the time. All the time. Um, and uh, it's a pleasure to support an organization. In fact, it's very interesting, but it's actually hard to give money out. It seems easy. But when there's so many fantastic organizations out there, to make that decision of where you're going to invest is very difficult. You, and at the end of the day, you will invest in someone that you have built somewhat of a relationship with and that you trust. So, and, and also organizations are used to getting a lot of requests and they give to multiple requests. They don't just have one gift and they're going to run out of money and they're going to, they're going to close shop. No, not at all. Individuals will give to many organizations throughout the year. So even if you know that another person has received money, go. They're philanthropic. They'll, they might support you even though they've given already to another organization and even a competitor or whatever. Yeah. Yes. My question is here. Uh, first of all, thank you for, uh, for your presentation. Really, really helpful for us. Uh, like, very specific question regarding long-term relationship because the money what we fundraised uh, in Tbilisi mostly because of our contacts we had with someone who later become peer manager of the large company and introduced someone and so on and so on. But what do you think, like, how, like what tools can we use? Because sometimes it's so difficult because being present, then also send like New Year or Christmas ma email or uh, something like very often or just uh, congratulate if they achieved something and so on. So that requires a lot of time. Like how can we somehow um, make some kind of much more effective relationship, but long-term relationship? Because just a very small example, only this year I spent like, more than three or five days sending emails, posts, uh, messages, new or like saying uh, Happy New Year or Merry Christmas because they, they are like very good friends of mine currently. But next time it will be quite difficult because we are doing a lot of job because we are students as well. What do you suggest? How can we proceed? That? So some of the some of the organizations I work with when I was with uh, Médecins Sans Frontières with Doctors Without Borders, I literally communicated approximately six to eight times per year with each donor, and I had about one hundred and thirty five thousand of them. Okay, of course I had a database to manage that, but I would um, write to them and ask them for money for up to four times a year. Sometimes we had an emergency, so I would send it out. Sometimes it was more, I wanted them to engage on a monthly basis and become a monthly donor. So I had uh, up to four times a year, uh, some, t some asks with them. And then I also had in between, I had two newsletters that I produced. And then I would also phone them once a year. So I engaged with them as 
often as I felt was normal. Um, and and uh, if they didn't want to be contacted that much, then I would change my relationship. I might contact them three to four times a year. And if they didn't give to me before December, I would write to them, like in, in you know, that last bit. And like so if they said they promised to give to me and they didn't, and it was just December 1st, I would write to them. It's like, hey, you promised you would give. And I've respected our communication flows. And now is that time, and I hope you'll consider, you know, renewing your support and upgrading your support because you've got some exciting projects. And so there's really no, um, there's no cycle, but I think, I think you do want to, um, if you're looking at about 30, you know, I, again, I built this little donor pyramid because I didn't, I, in speaking with Anita and Adriana, she said some, some chapters need to raise a thousand and some, you know, over a hundred thousand. So I just picked 55,000. But depending on how many relationships you have, um, you do want to engage with them. And, and they're excited to hear about what you're doing. If they're investing in you, they want to hear about your, how, you're, how you're doing. Um, again, I'm going to bring it back to that pair of running shoes. If you, if you got that pair of running shoes from your parents and then you show them that you were able to run and get a medal, that sec next time you need a new pair of running shoes, it'll be that much easier because you've proven that, you know what, you've put those running shoes to good use and it got you a medal. So it's the same thing. If someone gives you money and you go back to them and say, this is what we were able to deliver, they're more likely to give and increase their giving. So change your, so, so what I'm, I guess the example I was giving with, with Médecins Sans Frontières is that sometimes I would ask, sometimes I'd tell them what we've done with their money, other times I would call them. So I varied my communication with them um, based on, on, on building a normal relationship with a large number of people. Yeah, does that help? So the Christmas card is a great, is a great, uh, great uh, little touch point. Um, I, make, I make sure that I use every single space on those cards. I put at the back of the card the mission of my organization, my contact information. So, um, yeah, be, be creative. Don't just send a little random holiday card. Uh, put pictures of the, you know, get dressed up with a festive look. Take a picture, send this as the members of the, you know, make it, make it so that they, you can build trust with these people and show them who you are. Yeah. Put in a testimony. Um, I, I had a question. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, again, thank you for a very interesting uh, presentation. And uh, my question is, uh, if, if one chapter or one organization has uh, just one sponsor or donor that provides you with everything you need, like uh, infrastructure uh, and et cetera, to implement your projects and ideas, uh, like, is it worth of looking for additional donors and sponsors? Uh, or like if you have one organization that stably, stably supports you and provides you with everything, I mean, uh, isn't it risky to just work with one donor or? Yeah, and, my question. Yes, so I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that you are maybe referring to if you were organizing a conference, is that, would that be a good example? In this case where they're providing you with the room, the, the space, um, is, is that, tell, tell me a little bit more about this, this, um, this in-kind and gift that you're getting from them. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it's basically the university that provides us, us with everything. Like, uh, I mean, uh, we, we have a university that uh, stably supports us with everything. And so far, we didn't have uh, any like, problems with them. I mean, uh, we got everything we need from the university, basically. So, yeah. I mean, is it like, necessary to look for other donors and sponsors? I mean, because, yeah. It's a good question. I think I want to go back to what is what are your ambitions? Um, because if you've, you've, you've met your target and you feel good about it, um, because you always want to tell the donor. So if you get new donors, you want to tell them how you're going to use the money. They, want to, they don't necessarily want that money to just sit in a bank account for a rainy day. right? They gave you that check or they gave you that, that amount of money so that it could be put to good use. right? 
not in, in 10 years from now, but you know, relatively maybe in a two year span, I think that would be reasonable. 12 months is better, but 24 months is also okay. Um, so I, for me, I would go after more donors because I, to, to just uh, have one donor and if they don't renew the next year, uh, you're, you're starting from, from zero again and that's kind of scary at times. So I, I would uh, definitely look for other donors. And, but determine what, how you're going to use their contribution towards your ambitions. Again, it's that bigger picture of what you want to achieve. And, and if you did get more money, um, would that allow you to bring in a guest speaker? Would it allow you to, to do a little bit more towards your, your big picture? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Can I answer any other questions? Yes. There was also a question from um, Becco. I can't remember who. It was a gentleman. I'm sorry, I don't see your name. I'm, I'm sure you're still on the call. That we're, We talked a little bit about ethics. Um, a lot of the organizations, uh, there, there's, there's, uh, I'd like just to touch a little bit on this because uh, most of the organizations I've worked with, we've, we've, we had some, some organizations and companies specifically that we, we blacklisted, meaning that we just didn't feel that we should accept money from them because it, it came, it conflicted with our, with our mandate, what we want to achieve. So there's different schools of thoughts around there. There are some that say, let's not accept, move on. This is, this is clear. So when, for example, I was working with Médecins Sans Frontières, we didn't accept any money from alcohol companies or tobacco companies because we promote health. We also didn't accept money from mining industries because they uh, we're mining in developing uh, country or resource poor countries. And then you would notice that the people that lived in those, those communities where they wanted to uh, mine were now internally displaced people and required medical attention. So we just made a decision that we wouldn't ex accept money from oil, diamonds, and gold mining companies. We made it simple. The whole movement, that whole 23 offices now, all abide by those rules. There's others uh, that, for example, if you look at World Wildlife Fund, will engage with companies who have bad behaviors with the hope that by accepting their gifts, they will build a different relationship where they can influence them in changing their behavior because now they are engaged. So there's different ways and not one is better than the other. It depends just on how you, how Oikos uh, feels. So some say, you know what, we can change their behavior without taking their money. And in fact, we'd rather not take their money so we can have an honest conversations with these people, with these different companies and others that feel that you can take money and still engage in a meaningful conversation to change behaviors. So um, that's one aspect. I think there was another question that Anita had brought up, and I th I'm sure this might come up, especially if uh, there are a few chapters that are in Europe. What do you do when you have a company that has a presence in many, many different uh, cities or countries? How do you go about that? Um, I think that this, the amount, depending on the amounts that you are asking for, if you're looking at a million and, and above or maybe a maybe hundred thousand and above, you may want to coordinate your efforts because that will probably come from one, uh, maybe the headquarters. So even though you might approach the local regional or the local office of a company, um, you may want to coordinate. But if it's for a smaller amount, a lot of the corporations actually uh, do like to give back to their local community and comes from a different budget. So if you're looking for a smaller amount, then you don't necessarily have to coordinate amongst yourselves. However, if you start noticing that a lot of you are getting monies from the same company, 
then it might be really smart for you to share that information so that you might be able to leverage and grow and create maybe eventually something like a fellowship for the whole for Oikos, because I know that's one of the things that you've put forward. That, that's part of um, one of the activities that you do. Um, I think uh, Let me it's just, just add that the intranet on Podio will um, will serve that purpose soon. So make sure all of you are uh, on Podio. Uh, very soon you, you will have heard from your executive board members so um, that is very very crucial thank you for having brought that up Michelle because uh, that's one of the reasons why podium will be essential as well yeah I think um, when I think about you know when I was working with Médecins Sans Frontières because we had many offices it's kind of like having many chapters like you are we would get together once a year and this is a wonderful platform where now you don't even have to move, you don't have to take a plane, but it's to share maybe your list of, of successes and also your failures. And that was one thing that we did every year. We would have a meeting just internally. We would say, this failed royally, let's not replicate this. Or maybe someone did it and it worked in their country and I just didn't do it the right way. So do share your your experiences amongst yourselves. Um, I would certainly, you know, if everyone aligns and says, okay, in the next month, we're gonna get our group together, we're gonna identify who our top potential donors are, the new ones and the current ones, and then share that information. You will all benefit from learning from one another because maybe, maybe, um, I'm seeing Cassia here and there's a little bit of a group there and, um, trying to look in Vishal and Melanie, maybe you guys will come up with a list that's a lot more robust because maybe one chapter got some really innovative ideas in terms of an industry that they may want to approach. Um, yeah. So those are some of the things that I we used to do with Médecins Sans Frontières to share our share our learnings, good and bad, and ugly, <laughs> and fantastic. Shall we take one last question, if anybody has one? Mm, no? Okay, last chance. Okay. Michelle, would you like to add anything else? No, maybe just a quick wrap up. So I've given you a few tools here to help you. So try to think about your 30 second spiel. What is it that you're trying to do? Get that down clear, put it in writing, make sure everyone else does, uh, knows the same thing. I think put your donor pyramid together. So if your goal is to raise 5,000, if it's to raise 55,000, use that same principle where maybe your top 10 donors will give you 80% of your amount of, of your money and start putting down those names next to them. So those are, so once you get together as a group with some, and again, open it up. Don't be so close to just your little chapter and your own people. Invite people to come and, and be part of this idea of brainstorming about who you could approach. Bring alumni, bring, bring professors. You'd be surprised how many people they know. And, um, you know, even bring friends that might be really well connected because their parents know people or maybe they work for a specific company that you might want. Just bring them in, identify those need, those lists and then engage them to opening doors. Again, on that spectrum of donors, try to target those that are most engaged and where there's most alignment between what you want to achieve, that big time impact, that outcome that you're seeking. So that again, that alignment between that 30 second spiel and what their interests are, there's a match. I guess it's almost like Tinder there, <laughs> but a little bit more sophisticated, okay? Um, then, uh, so the donor pyramid, your, your case, your story, get some testimonies and share your pictures so you can come up with something a little bit creative and fun. And voila, and don't forget to keep track of those relationships and steward them. So get in touch with them. Tell them what you're, uh, you're doing. Get them excited. Get them involved. Invite them to different events that you're doing. These are all excellent touch points to building that relationship. So I think those are my closing remarks. 
Okay, thank you very much, Michelle. Um, a round of applause for Michelle, even though we're muted. <laughs> or like this yeah. for the deaf. Um, so, Michelle, thank you very much once again. Uh, I hope all the other ones, uh, all the attendees here, and even the ones who left us in between, um, that you've managed to um, gain something out of this um, skillful uh, conversation and presentation. And um, we will, well, for, for the presidents amongst you, we will meet very soon at the spring meeting where we will actually um, discuss and touch upon some of these points. Um, so uh, we will uh, meet in person uh, for you to ask any questions you want again. Um, and. Um, Personally, I think also for us, it has been uh, very useful at the international level and we will try and, um, and um, integrate some of these um, advice uh, methodologies uh, into what we will do uh, in the future. So okay. once again, uh, also Adriana, thank you for having uh, done this via contact as <laughs> Michelle basically thank keeps on advocating. Um, and um, yeah, I, I'm very uh, hopeful that we will manage and all find our finances uh, this year within our chapters and within the international organization. It just requires a lot of work and a lot of uh, doing it all together and um, sustaining and helping each other. So I think um, that that is going to be crucial. Uh, have a great evening or night. Thanks. And for some of you, see you soon uh, at the spring meeting in March in Lille. Thank you again. Thank you. And all the best and enjoy. It's a lot of fun. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.